Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam and the focus of our lecture today is on how children learn English morphology. The article that we read for today was by Jean Burko, published in 1958. The article is entitled, The Child's Learning of English Morphology. And this article was published in the journal Word. Uh, before we get into the main article for today, let's go ahead and contextualize the article, okay? Recall that this week we've been thinking about how children learn language, right? How is, it, how is language acquisition possible was sort of one of the main questions that we had. And so far we looked at two different views on how language acquisition is possible. One view was put forward by B.F. Skinner in verbal behavior. And this was based off of behaviorist psychology and a learning theory view of language acquisition. Recall that this view is that language acquisition is due to learning from experience-based training and conditioning. Recall that I compared this to, I said that on this view, learning a language is similar to learning how to skateboard, right? It's something that is uh, picked up from experience, perhaps through some sort of trial and error, some sort of rewards and punishments, right? I fall when I try to do a kick flip or a 360 flip, it hurts. I realize that's not the right way to do that trick, okay? And I use uh, reward and punishment, right? I land the trick and I feel excellent and amazing about it. And so I can use a form of reward and punishment to steer my learning of how to skateboard or behaviors of that kind, okay? On the behaviorist view, learning a language is just like this, right? It's something that is acquired from the outside world and then put into our minds, an, emp an empiricist view of language learning, okay? A very different view of language acquisition is put forward by Noam Chomsky. And recall that this was made very clear in his review of B.F. Skinner's verbal behavior. The view of Noam Chomsky is a nativist view, right? And this is the view that language, language acquisition is due to an innate cognitive module that we have for learning a language, which Chomsky, Chomsky calls universal grammar or UG for short. Okay. On this view, language acquisition is due to the development of an innate cognitive module with rules for language. Okay. Recall on this view that learning a language um, is language is something that we develop, right? Our language acquisition ability is due to a language module which is innate to us, just like some of the other physiological modules are innate to us, like our heart, our lungs, and so on, right? We don't need to learn how to grow a heart or how to grow lungs. These are just part of our natural endowment and through growth and maturity, right? All things being healthy and normal, they mature for us and we're able to um, pump blood through our body with the heart and we're able to understand language with our universal grammar, our cognitive module for language. Okay, so that's that view. So we see that there's two very different views. One's a more empiricistic view or an empiricist view, Skinner, behaviorism. One's more of a nativist view, okay, and that's Chomsky. Okay, now that we sort of understand the debate, right, is language largely innate, is largely language largely based on experience, now we can properly situate the article by Burko, okay, our main article for today. This article focuses on how children learn English morphology. And recall that morphology has to do with the rules for putting words together, okay? So we have a word like dog, right? And then there's a rule for how to form the plural of dog, right? What's the plural of dog? Dogs, right? We add an S and that turns it from a singular to a plural, okay? But notice that we can also apply that rule, plural formation to another word like car, right? That's a singular term. What's the plural of car? How you apply that same rule, right? It's cars, right? 
What's the plural of grade? Add an S, grades, right? This has to do with morphology. We're applying a rule, a morphological rule to the word, the morpheme, to generate a new word, right? To derive a new word from the first word. Okay, and recall that we have prefixes that we attach to the beginning of a word. So we can have a word like game and then add a prefix like pre, and now we have the new word pre-game. Okay, we can also have a word or a morpheme game and then add a suffix to it. So we, ha we have the word now gamer, right? Someone that plays games, right? Um, there's also um, uh, expletive infixation where we have things like fan effing tastic, where we add the morpheme in the middle, right? We apply the rules into the middle, right? Rather than just the front and the back, right? So those are just different affixes that we can attach either to the front pre, to the end suffix, or in the middle infix, okay? This is what the article is about, is we, we wanna see if children apply rules morphological rules, right, to new instances, to new words that they've never heard before, or what Berkeley calls nonsense words, okay? Berkeley does a great job of summarizing the idea behind the study here with this paragraph. So let's go ahead and take a moment to look at this paragraph, okay? In this study, we set out to discover what is learned by children exposed to English morphology. To test for knowledge of morphological rules, we use nonsense materials. We know that if the subject can supply the correct plural ending, for instance, to a noun we have made up, he has internalized a working system of the plural allomorphs in English and is able to generalize to new cases and select the right form. If a child knows that the plural of which is which is, he may simply have memorized that plural form. If, however, he tells us that the plural of gutch is gutches, we have evidence that he actually knows, albeit unconsciously, one of those rules, which the descriptive linguist, too, would set forth in his grammar. Okay, so the important, one of the important things here is that Burkle wants to figure out if children's knowledge of morphology is based only in memory and previous experience, right? This would be closer to behaviorism and learning theory, right? So I know that the plural of dog is dogs because I've heard dog before. I've heard the plural form of that before, dogs, and I just memorized that, right? So that's how I'm able to generate, um, generate the plural of dog based on learning theory, right? However, if children are not only able to form the plural of sensible words they've already been exposed to, but further, they can apply the correct rule, abstract rule to a new nonsense instance. That means that they're not doing this based on experience or based on rote memorization because they have never been exposed to these nonsense words before, right? So by giving them nonsense words, by giving them novel stimuli, we can see if they're applying abstract rules to new instance in sort of a productive rule-based way, or if they're only just drawing upon rote memorization for to express their knowledge of language, okay? So you can see that this is a very cool design for the study in order to test whether knowledge of morphology is based on memorization or uh, learning theory or something more like rules, okay? All right, so let's talk a moment about the methodology behind this study, okay? Although this study focuses on children, how children apply morphological rules to novel nonsense instances, we need some criterion for determining whether the application of a morphological rule is correct or not, right? R remember that in this study, what we wanna do is see if children apply morphological rules to novel instances correctly in a principled way. So in order to determine that, we need some criteria for correctness, okay? So in order to have some standard by which we can determine whether children are doing, applying the rule correctly or not, we will also have adults perform this task as well, okay? So we'll see in the slides that 
we're going to have a set of stimuli that children are exposed to, and then they're going to have to generate an answer to, and we're going to have adults go through this as well, so that way we can compare child performance, right, the kids in the study are between four and seven years old, we're going to compare their performance to adult performance, okay, so I can ask you, uh, what's the plural of car, right, and then as adults, we're all going to say cars, right, what's the plural of dog? And as adults, we're all gonna say dogs, right? And so the idea is based on what adults uniformly agree on, right? Morphologically, we can then see if four to seven-year-olds match that performance or to what extent they match that performance or whether their behavior is just completely idiosyncratic, right? It might be the case that in the three to four dozen children that we study that they each generate a completely new word or instance in this blank spot, okay? That would go to show that there's no rule that they're following consistently in their application to new instances. If, however, we see that most children are applying the same word in this fill in the blank position, that's um, convincing evidence that they're following some rule to get that right answer, right? Especially notice this isn't, a, this isn't a multiple choice format. They have to provide the word, right? So if uh, four dozen kids are converging on the word that they produce, that's strong instance, uh, strong evidence that they're applying an abstract morphological rule to the new nonsense word to derive the correct form, okay? Cool. So let's go ahead and look at the different uh, stimuli, the different morphological forms that children and adults are tested on. Okay. It's, it's very nice. Uh, this is a very nice article to examine for today, not only for the results that it provides us, but also for the methodology that it provides us, right? For those of you that are interested in maybe replicating this study and extending it to another language, Maybe you want to see if, you know, since this article focuses on English, you might write another article, right? Like titled The Child's Learning of Spanish Morphology or The Child's Learning of French Morphology or of Morphology in American Sign Language, right? And in order for you to do that study, your study, you can draw upon the methods and design here so that way you can replicate and extend this work, right? And you might be able to show that just as Burko showed for English morphology in four to seven-year-olds, right? In your new study, you show a similar result with four to seven-year-olds with Spanish morphology, okay? So let's go ahead and take a moment to look through the stimuli so we get an idea of how to design a study that checks for plurals and these different morphological forms. All right, so here's the plural form. There is a wug. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two. Fill in the blank for me. Right? And take a moment to generate what you think is the correct response to that question. Okay. And if you're like me, what you generated was the word wugs, right? Uh, there is a car. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two cars. Right. Similarly, we apply the same rule to the word wugs, right? And or to the word wug, and we get the new word wugs, which is a, a still a nonsense word, but it's one that we have sensibly applied the morphological rule for forming plurals, right? Um, so just remember that adult performance on this task is considered the correct answer. And so 91% of children provided the correct plural form for this nonsense word, right? So when we give this, this stimuli to four to seven year olds, 91% of them provide wugs as the correct response or as their response, okay? And you can just see in table three that this is the case, right? So the item is wugs, and we see that it's 91% correct, okay? 91% of children provided this form, okay? And we see that this is actually excellent. You might think, ah, 91%, that's not that good. 
but you'll see that for the, there was sort of like a control word, uh, glasses, right? And they performed their accuracy, uh, the 91% was the same for both a real word and this nonsense word, okay? So you can sort of see that 91% is like the upper limit for them for sense wor sensible words that they already know and nonsense words. So WUGS reaches that limit, okay? So for, for, for them, WUGS, they can work with that almost like it's a word that they know, right? So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see that. Okay, let's look at some more examples though. Now let's look at uh, past tense, right? Now what we wanna do is provide stimuli to test for the rule that they apply to form the correct past tense forms of nonsense words. So this is a man that knows how to spell. He is spelling. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday he, and take a moment to try to generate the correct response. And we see that. The correct response is spout, right? The correct response spout is what all the adults responded with. And 52% of children provided that as the correct past tense form of that nonsense word, okay? So not as good as the wug wugs, right? But still 52% of children are generating this form in, in this sort of fill in the blank context, right? So it's not like a multiple choice where they're choosing like A or B and they have a 50% chance of guessing the right response, like a forced choice response, but they're generating this form in this fill in the blank. So you see that 52% is still a, a very insightful telling result, okay? All right, cool. And we see here on table four, just so that we get practice looking for the correct answers in our tables, we see that if we're looking for spout right here and a percentage correct, 52% right there, okay? Cool, let's keep it going. Now we wanna test for derived adjectives. And here's some stimuli to test for that. This is a dog with quirks on him. He is all covered with quirks. What kind of dog is he? He is a blank dog, all right? And, and notice what's important here is not that you memorize what an uh, adjective is, but that you have an intuition of what the right form goes in there, right? So you may not remember what adjectives and adverbs are. Um, it may have been a while since you've studied linguistics, but you probably have a good intuition of what's the proper word form to go in there, right? And that's the important thing. So take a moment and try to figure out what word goes in there, right? And we're, we're working with this quirk, okay? So something derived from quirk. And it's quirky, right? This is a dog with quirks on him. He is all covered with quirks. What kind of dog is he? He is a quirky dog or he is a spotty dog or whatnot, right? Adults' uh, performance on this task is again considered the correct answer for the derived adjective. Interestingly enough, children four to seven years old did not produce quirky for um, um, as a model. Um, they did not derive quirky from quirk, right? What they tended to do with derived adjectives is they tended to form compounds. Okay, so this result is a little different than the other results that we'll look at the, from the previous slides and the subsequent slides. Um, but I still just wanna point this out because uh, we just wanna keep this result in mind. Okay, um, it may be interesting for us to further investigate what's going on here with derived adjectives, right? We might maybe examine, we might wanna examine in an, another study older children, and we can sort of assess at what age do they start applying the correct um, derived adjective for this, for this form, right? So what's important here is not that each paper provides absolute uniform results, right? It's, it's just data that we need to read and interpret. And here we need to sort of um, put a check mark here or flag this and ask a question, like what is going on with this result? How can we do further work to gain further clarity on this result? Okay, 
All right, so the point here is that for this form of the nonsense word, children prefer to form compounds such as quirk dog instead of using a derivational suffix quirky. Okay. The next example we want to look at is the third person singular form. And this is the example for this form. This is a man who knows how to naz. He is nazzing. He does it every day. Every day he, and then tell me what fits in that blank position. Every day he what? Every day he nazzes, right? For this form, 48% of children provide the correct third person singular form for this nonsense word, okay? So they're matching adults about half the time here, okay? Which is still um, a significant finding. And we can find this result, read it from the table by looking at this table over here. And then we'll look for NAS is, right? Third singular. And we see that the correct answer is 48%, right? So when I ask you on the quiz, what percentage responded correctly to this form? No problem, right? You can just read it from the table. Cool. Next. Right, we just looked at the third person singular. So let's look at the singular possessive next. The example for this is, this is a wug who owns a hat. Whose hat is it? It is the blank hat, right? What's the correct form that goes in there? The correct answer that most adults provide is wugs, right? This is a wug who owns a hat. Whose hat is it? It's the wugs hat, right? And 84% of children provide the correct singular possessive form for this nonsense word. And we can read that from the table. We see that's provided in table five. We're looking for singular possessive. So we see singular here and we go to boom, WUGS, 84%, okay? Moving right along. Next, we wanna test for the plural possessive. All right, so now there are two wugs. They both own hats. Whose hats are they? They are the blank hats. Go ahead and fill that in with the appropriate form. And you should have provided for me wugs, right? It sounds the same in spoken English, but we can see through written language, there's just a slight difference to this form, okay? And on this form, 88% uh, of children provided the correct plural possessive form for this nonsense word, right? And we can look it up here in table five. We looked at singular in the last example. Now we're looking at plural. We see that the plural is 88% reading from the table, okay? So excellent, right? They're performing really high on these forms. So we can sort of see that it, for most morphological forms, children are applying rules. And then we can also uh, um, analyze sort of which ones they do the best on, right? Which ones, which are the forms in which they perform the highest or in which they approximate adult performance at the earliest age. All right, so now that we had uh, a look through this study by Burko, this very interesting study by Burko, let's just summarize some of the main findings, right? Like, what should you take away from this article besides just uh, insight into the method of this article? Some of the main findings from this article. One, interestingly enough, since Burko examined both boys and girls, um, young children, Burko discovered that boys perform equally well as girls on the morphological tasks. And this is interesting because in the context of existing work at the time, it was thought that girls tend to be better than boys in certain linguistic aspects, right? This, this study suggests that at least in this uh, way of analyzing language, right? English morphology at this age, boys and girls tend to perform about the same, okay? So that's an interesting result. Uh, another interesting finding is that there were some differences between the performance of preschoolers and first graders, okay, with first graders providing more correct adult-like answers than preschoolers, okay, which suggests that there is some sort of fine-tuning or developmental improvement, okay. 
And we can see that by comparing these two columns in this table, right? So this is the correct percentage of correct um, preschool answers. And this is the percentage of correct first grade answers. So answers by preschoolers, answers by first graders. And you can see, for example, that even on a, 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 a non nonsense word, so a sensible word of the English language, language like classes, that even for that sensible word, preschoolers perf don't perform as well in forming the plural of that as first graders do, right? So we see that there's improvement both for sensible words and nonsense words, okay? And then we see, for example, for, for wugs, forming the plural of wug, that the percentage correct was 76 in preschool, but 97 in first grade, right? So we see sort of uh, an improvement from preschool to first grade, okay? And so this is just another interesting result because it's just highlighting the fact that even though four to seven-year-olds perform rather well in general. If we look, we break it down into more fine-grained results, we also see that there's some improvement from preschool to first grade, okay? And that also suggests something, right? Like this level of competence is not something we're born with from day zero or day one, okay? Another important finding or take-home point from this article is that since young children are able to provide the correct morphological forms for nonsense words, this suggests that children have internalized a working system of morphological rules in English and are able to generalize to new cases and select the right form, okay? The question is now, right, um, we have some very interesting results here that suggest that children do internalize the morphological rules of language and this happens at a very early age, right? Between four and seven, they have um, fairly good performance on applying morphological rules to form new instances of words. We have further questions now is um, how early, right? Are they able to apply morphological rules? Maybe we can try to push this study even younger. Right. And then we can also push the study later and see like at what age they're able to now form the correct form for adjectives. Right. So each study is not um, is not complete in and of itself. And what I mean by that is like just one article isn't going to establish nativism or behaviorism by itself. Right. But you can see that through a system of interrelated papers and research, we can start to converge on the best, most reasonable answer, all right, to our question of how do children learn words? What age do they learn these words? And more importantly, the rules for generating new words, morphological rules for generating new words. And as we'll continue in future lectures, we'll think about not only rules for generating new words, morphological rules, but also rules for generating new sentences or syntactic rules. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and that you got a lot out of it. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.